Hello, my name is Martin Persson. Uh, welcome to this short video lecture on environmental ethics, uh, in which I will uh, introduce concepts like moral standing, anthropocentrism, uh, biocentrism, and ecocentrism. The first important thing to remember is that sustainable development is a normative concept. It says something about how we ought to act, how we should organize our societies. And as such, it must always be based on some sort of moral values. And a key question that this raises is whose interests should be accounted for when we define what the sustainable development is. And this can be linked to the moral uh, concept of moral standing. So moral standing uh, is the question of whose interests should be accounted for when we decide what is right and what is wrong. Um, and this can also be linked to final values. So, for example, uh, if we say that uh, the experiences of, of happiness or suffering has final value, then all sentient beings that can experience suffering or happiness have moral standing, whereas a stone uh, that can't experience those uh, feelings does not have moral standing. So our conception or idea of who has moral standing has changed and developed over time. Uh, so we've gone from a world where people thought that only me, my family, maybe my clan or my race has moral standing uh, to a world where we have the United Nations Universal Declaration on, on Human Rights saying that all humans, uh, regardless of the color of your skin, uh, sexual orientation, political or religious beliefs, have the same uh, value and the same rights. Um, and this is often called anthropocentrism, so putting humans in the center. And there can be uh, different arguments for why only humans have or why humans have moral standing. Uh, you can base it on a utilitarian. Um, value saying that humans can feel suffering and happiness and so on and therefore they have moral standing or you can base it more on a, on a duthetical uh, argument saying that all uh, human life is an end in itself and therefore all humans have some inalienable rights for example uh, so what anthropocentrism does is that it makes a distinction between humans and the rest of nature uh, and this can be Trace back to this uh, dual, idea of dualism from, from Descartes saying, you know, his quote, I think, therefore I am distinguishing humans from the rest of nature. So it's only humans that can have moral standing. What we do in sustainable development is that we extend moral standing from humans living today to humans that will also exist in the future. So unborn human beings. From a philosophical philosophical this this uh, far from straightforward, but there is a quite a clear intuition here. Uh, you could argue that it shouldn't matter where on earth uh, you are born for whether you have moral standing or not. Uh, and in the same way, you can argue it shouldn't matter when in time you're born for whether you have moral standing or not. So the idea of sustainable development is originally an anthropocentric idea. Uh, so uh, the standard definition of sustainable development from the Brundtland report doesn't explicitly say only humans, but it talks about future generations, meaning future human generations. Another example of, of an expression of anthropocentrism is the idea of or concept of ecosystem services. Uh, which views nature purely as an instrumental value for us humans. Uh, so nature has a value in that it pr provides services and benefits for us humans, uh, not having moral standing in itself. So you can expand the circle of moral concern even further. And, uh, and the first step to do that is to include also other sentient beings, not only humans, uh, in the circle. Uh, and the arguments for that can be very much the same as those for anthropocentrism. Uh, so saying that other sentient beings can also feel suffering, pain and happiness, and therefore uh, their interests should count. Or seeing, uh, in the words of, of uh, animal rights philosopher Tom Regan, uh, other sentient beings as subjects of life whose interests also should be accounted for. Uh, you can go back even further if you, if we, thinking about a sort of Western philosophical tradition, one of the first philosophers to, 
to express this idea uh, was the father of utilitarianism, uh, Jeremy Bentham, who said, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer, uh, as an argument for also giving, accounting for, for, for the interests of animals in, uh, in utilitarianism. But then you can go even further. Uh, you can argue that all living beings have moral standing. Uh, so not only individual humans and, and animals that are, uh, that are conscious, but also individual plants, trees, uh, insects, and so on. And this is often called biocentrism. Uh, and the argument here uh, can be that all life has a goal uh, to live, to thrive, to reproduce. Uh, and this goal, this interest, is not dependent on whether uh, an entity can express or feel that uh, or not. So therefore, all individual life should have moral standing. Again, uh, this, of course, this idea uh, of biocentrism is enshrined in, in many sort of traditional religious beliefs, uh, natural religions. Uh, um, but in the Western philosophical traditions, uh, an early proponent of this view was, was Albert Schweitzer, uh, who's a Nobel laureate in peace, who said, I am life which wills to live, and I exist in the midst of a life which wills to live. Uh, sometimes this is also expressed as reverence for life. Um, finally, one can expand the circle of moral concern to include whole ecosystems in what is often called ecocentrism. Uh, it's important to note uh, there's a qualitative dis distinction here. So in, in anthropocentrism, zoocentrism, biocentrism, the focus is on individual, the individual life, the individual human being you know, or animal. Whereas in ecocentrism, the focus is on, on the whole, on the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, and, and it's only ecosystems that have moral standing. Uh, and the constitutions of, of, of the ecosystems, the living beings, only have instrumental value. Uh, and you can argue uh, for this based on an idea that, that ecosystems have certain properties, stability, integrity, beauty, uh, which in itself has final value and should be uh, conserved or, or preserved. Or you can think of ecosystems as superorganisms. You might have heard of the concept of Gaia uh, and the interest of these superorganisms should be accounted for when we decide what is right and wrong to do. Uh, again, in the Western philosophical tradition, uh, one of the first people to sort of promote this idea uh, with some impact was Aldo Leopold. Um, uh, a U.S. Uh, conservationist who said the thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So it should be noted that while moral philosophy have uh, dealt extensively with, with uh, anthropocentrism in, in, in deciding on what's right and what is wrong in terms of human affairs, and there's also quite a big literature on, on animal rights and including animal in the utilitarian thinking. Uh, the, the concepts of biocentrism and ecocentrism has been much less explored. So if we take uh, Albert Schweitzer's idea of biocentrism, it, it's quite vague and fluffy. It can more be viewed as some sort of virtue uh, ethics. Uh, we should have reverence for life, try to tread as lightly as possible on earth, uh, avoid uh, hurting other uh, living beings, but it doesn't really detail what to do when, when human interests conflict with, other, with the interests of other uh, living beings. So one of the few philosophers to actually try to develop a more stringent theory around biocentrism is, is Paul Taylor, uh, who's, who argues that, that all living beings have equal moral standing, uh, something you can call biocentric egalitarianism, which is a, a stronger interpretation uh, of, um, of biocentrism. Of course, uh, what this means is uh, it doesn't mean that, that humans or other, human, or other living beings can never hurt another living beings. Uh, we have the right to, to fulfill our basic needs. So we, if we need to hunt or if we need to kill other plants in order to live, uh, that is right for us to do in the same way that the lion is not wrong when it kills its prey. Uh, the question is, of course, how far do you extend? What do you include in, in, in these basic uh, human needs? Uh, and here Paul Taylor does go a bit further and say, well, we also have 
needs to develop ourselves as individuals or develop our civilization. So if we need to cut down a forest in order to build a library, that can also be morally permissible. And in that way, you could say that he goes a bit uh, more towards the weaker interpretation and saying that human interests do take um, preference over uh, the interest of some um, other living beings. But so you can view biocentrism uh, in a stronger or weaker sense. And in the same way with ecocentrism. Uh, so in a strong interpretation of ecocentrism uh, argues that only uh, ecosystems have moral standing. They are the only entities. Uh, and, and individual beings have only instrumental value. Uh, and this open, uh, opens up to what, what can be called ecofascism. So setting aside human rights uh, for, for, for the rights of ecosystems. So it can be a right to hurt or, or even kill human beings uh, if that is what is best for the ecosystems. Uh, on the other side, a more weak interpretation uh, of ecocentrism would say that, well, in addition to humans or maybe all sentient beings having moral standing, ecosystems do as well. The question then again uh, is how do you weigh the moral standing of humans against the moral standing of uh, ecosystems? Whose interest uh, do you? Um, put in the first uh, seat. So you can read more about environmental ethics and these different environmental ethics framework, anthropocentrism, biocentrism, ecocentrism, uh, in chapter four of our textbook, Sustainable Development, uh, Nuances and Perspectives.